cat for a walk can be frustrating. She stops to smell everything. Smells are a part of God's creation. Some of the smells that we smell, well, they smell amazing. Mm. Some may be less so. Oh, Mum! Sorry! Our verse today is a little strange. But their idols are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. It talks about how the countries who lived around Israel had idols made of silver and gold. They couldn't do any of the things God can do. They couldn't speak or see or smell. They weren't real. But look at our God, though. He can see all we do. He hears our prayers. And he can smell. David prays to God in Psalm 141. May my prayer be set before you like incense. Now, Incense is a substance that is burnt so that a sweet smelling smoke rises upward. David wants God to find his prayer sweet smelling. 
because our God is not like the fake gods. He is real and can smell our praises. So pray to him and praise him. Sing along at home when the songs are playing and then sing out when we're allowed back together again. God thinks your prayers are amazing and that they smell wonderful. So sing, praise, and God can smell them. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Morning, RPAC Church. It's Dan here. It's uh, wonderful to be gathered again for another online service. Welcome, especially if you're somebody who hasn't come to church before and done church with us online. Welcome. I want to start this morning by saying, how big is our God? How big is he? How awesome is our God? How worthy of praise is our God? And um, I wanted to begin this morning by sharing a psalm that I just found so encouraging when it came to the bigness and the awesomeness and the wonder of our God. I'm not sure about you, but sometimes um, I think that I can tend to think of God as this small little man who lives in my heart, who I pray to in the quiet moments, or maybe um, some of us might tend to sometimes think of, of God and as following God as kind of a way of life, like one among many ways of life that we might be able to choose, a self-helpy, um, guru-following-esque kind of um, faith that we might have in a God who we could worship and praise or we could not. We can very easily make God a lot smaller than he really is. This psalm, though, leaves no room for misinterpretation or doubt as to the size and the awesomeness and the power and the wonder of our God, because not only is he bigger than the small little God that I might pray to in the quiet moments, not only is he bigger than um, a way of life that we might choose among many, he is a God who commands and demands the praise, not only of us people, but of every single thing that exists in the whole universe. Every single thing owes God their praise. And every single thing that God has created glorifies him just by their very existing and by their beauty and by the splendor that he created in them. I'm going to read this psalm which talks about everything praising God because he is so big and wondrous and awesome. So I'm going to read Psalm 148 to begin. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens, and he has raised up for his people a horn. The praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. My goodness, how worthy of praise is this God of ours. And we are gathered here again this morning to offer him that God who commands all of that praise. We are gathered here to offer our praise to him this morning. Ray soon will be preaching to us from the book of Judges. And just before that, Chris is going to read the Bible and offer a prayer uh, for us to pray together. Uh, before we get to that, though, I just had one quick announcement, which is really exciting. Jared emailed it out to all the regular members during the week. And that is that we have a date for regathering again. We will be gathering again as a church Unless some cataclysmic event gets in the way, we will be gathering again on November 7th. That's just three Sundays time from now. So in three Sundays time from this morning, we will be gathered together again as a church. There's going to be more details about exactly what that's going to look like. Uh, there's going to be some things that will be a bit different as we deal with 
the COVID um, restrictions that we have to uh, adhere to. But it's just going to be so wonderful to be gathered again. November 7th, put in your diary, plan to be there because it's going to be really wonderful to be together as a family again. Chris is now going to share the Bible with us and share a prayer with us. And then Ray's going to preach. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be with you and to be able to pray and read the Bible um, for this service this Sunday. Will you pray with me? You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created, and have their being. You are worthy, Jesus, for you were slain, you were killed, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, to him who sits on the throne, and to Jesus, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Lord, we thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work and leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, and for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing. And Lord, Lord Jesus, teach us to be generous. Teach us to serve you as you deserve, to give and not count the cost, to fight and not heed the wounds, to toil and work and not seek for rest, to labour and not seek for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will. Amen. Lord, we are going to bring before you some of our concerns. Lord, and we think of the world and we want to pray for peace uh, in those countries like Afghanistan that has a new government, um, in Lebanon that is still struggling uh, with their government and life and especially past the explosion that occurred um, earlier on. God of the nations, whose sovereign rule brings justice and peace, have mercy on our broken and divided world. We pray especially for those countries that we just mentioned and for other countries, Lord, that are in disarray. Establish your peace in the hearts of all and banish from them the spirit that makes for war, that all races and peoples may learn to live in, as members of one family and in obedience to your laws. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Lord, closer to home, we lift up to you our country um, as we do our own battles with the pandemic. We give thanks, Lord, for those um, who have the skill to develop vaccines and that we have seen the reward of that in being able to be protected. Uh, we give thanks for those people, Lord, and for governments who are willing to provide that vaccine. Lord, we also uh, think of our health workers who are still at the front line and we know there are still many cases circulating in our community and this we know will go on but we do pray father that you would help each one of us to do what we can to stay protected to protect our family and to protect other people lord we commit to you those of our church who are ill or suffering in any way with grief or struggling with their um, home situation, their accommodation, and that need to come before you and seek help. We lift them to you now, Lord. And those we know, we name in our hearts. Father, we know you have everything under control and in your control. We do not understand always, Lord, how this works or, or why sometimes things happen. But we do know that you have our best interests at heart. 
Help us to truly believe this, Lord. And even when we struggle to trust it, to lean in on you because there is nowhere else to go. And we thank you, Lord, that you always listen. And your word tells us this, you always listen and you always hear us. Um, and that our prayers do make a difference. And so, and so we lift up each other to you now, Lord. And we think of um, our elderly congregation, Lord, and ask that you would be with them. Um, help them in loneliness as, as we are just coming out of uh, the isolation. And in some places in New South Wales, even they, they're still in isolation. Uh, we ask that you would be with them, Lord, and that they would know that they are never, never alone because you are by their side. And I thank you for the encouragement of Christians who have walked with you for many years um, and know this and have shared this with, with uh, um, the rest of us, Lord, so that we are encouraged by their depth of faith um, and their knowledge of you. Lord, we commit to you our um, church leaders. We think of uh, Jared and Joe and Dan and Renee and um, uh, Scott and Britt. And we pray for all of them, Lord, and ask that you would walk with them, give them wisdom in their decision making. We also think of Glenn um, and Rebecca, Glenn and Leslie, Rebecca and John, um, also, Lord, in those positions of authority um, and pray that you would give them wisdom as well. We thank you for the encouragement they are to us in the congregation. And as we plan to come out of um, isolation from church, Lord, and those plans are in place, give us that great sense of joy as we meet together in the weeks and months ahead, Lord, as we join together and lift our voices to you. And in the meantime, Lord, help us to lift our voices to you in our homes um, and just know that you hear us, whether we're at home, whether we're in a church building, uh, whether we're out in a car park, you hear us and you see us, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name, for all of these things. Amen. Now I'm going to read the Bible and I'm reading from, you can have your paper Bible like I have, or you might like to have it on your phone and that's great. Um, and we are reading from Judges. Um, Judges is such an interesting book. So we're going to be reading from Judges 13 and Judges 14. We're reading Judges 13, the first seven verses, and Judges 14, the first four verses. Read with me. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, so that the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or fermented drink, that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched with a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Then the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you will become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or fermented drink and do not eat anything unclean because the boy will be a Nazarite of God from the womb until the day of his death. So that's that one. 
Now, we're moving to chapter 14, and we're going to read the first four verses. Samson, who was the boy? Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among our relatives or among our, all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She is the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. Hmm. Good morning, everyone. Absolute delight to be with you again this morning and to uh, have the opportunity to read God's Word and talk about it and look at the implications for the way we live as God's people. I hope you find what we're going to do encouraging. What I'm going to do is, is, is take a part, a small part of, of the book of Judges. You've heard the section read that we're going to be looking at. And it's an interesting book. And I've called what I'm going to say or talk about today, Whose Eyes Do We See Through? Let me introduce the book of Judges to you just for a moment. Uh, historically, it was placed uh, between the time of Joshua and his death and up until the time of the first king of Israel, about 1,200 years before the birth of Christ. And what it does is it details the, the behaviour of God's people during that time. We notice that, that, that there's a cyclical process going on. We notice uh, that, that the people misbehave, sin, and then God sends a judge and the judge saves them and, and things are all right for a time and then we go through the process again. But what we do notice, which is really interesting, is that the behaviour of the Israelites gets worse and worse as each cycle progresses and the quality of the judges gets very, very suspect as the book progresses. So that the final judge, Samson, is a deplorable character. Finally, at the end of the book, the salvation of God's people relies on the actions of one man, and that's this man, Samson, that we just spoke about, flawed as he was, giving his life for the people. That's a bit of a hint to people that this is the way people are going to be saved. It'll take the death of one man for the nation. Uh, we are left dissatisfied at the end of the book because nothing's really resolved and we look forward to a new kind of saviour, perhaps a king or a perfect king. Again, pointing forward to the New Testament. Um, so, having given you that background, what does this part of the story of Samson teach us about God and the nature of our relationship to him? And there's a couple of points I want to bring out. And as I said, I hope you find them really helpful and really challenging. The first point is this. How do we see the world? How do we look at it? What sort of narrative do we function on? Let's see how Israel was going with how they saw the world and their relationship with God. And it's pretty well summed up in chapter 13, verse 1, and it says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. The important words there are, the people did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is a thematic statement, and it occurs again and again and again in Judges. The people did evil in the sight of the Lord. But right at the end of the book, right at the end of the book, there's a summing up statement and it says, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. Now that says quite clearly that doing right in your own eyes is the same as doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Samson um, seeks to marry a Philistine unbeliever. 
Now, this was just hopeless. He shouldn't have been doing this. He said to his parents, get her for me because she is right in my eyes. Uh, chapter 14, verse 3 says that. And then he went down and talked with the woman and she was right in Samson's eyes. Israel and Samson's approach to doing what is right in their own eyes and having no reference to what is right in God's eyes is so 21st century. People say, no one can tell you what's right or wrong. It's up to you to decide for yourself. Let your conscience guide you. Let it decide what is right and wrong for you. Um, or maybe we don't follow even our conscience. We kind of just follow what most people are doing. What most people decide the age should look like. This is called the zeitgeist of the age, the general feeling of the age. Surely millions of people can't be wrong, so I'll follow that way. Um, I remember when I was at university, uh, there was a, many decades ago, there, there was Fisher Library, which was the main library, and beside that was a multi-storey building uh, called Fisher Stack. And in the stack were all the books and resources for the library. It was built in the, in the period of what they call brutalist architecture, which means they just poured raw concrete and, and with all the holes and the imperfections in it, and that became the building. It, uh, and it was the inside of the building looked rough and raw with little, little holes and notches in the concrete. And I'm sitting in there studying one day, and I looked at one of the holes. You could see I was really invested in my study. I looked at one of the holes, and there was a little speech bubble drawn from it. And when I looked at what was in the speech bubble, it was really interesting because it said, eat garbage, millions of flies can't be wrong. Well, of course, millions of flies are wrong. And if we listen to a whole lot of people that have a particular view, but it's garbage, then we're going to swallow that garbage. That's what the guy was saying there. Um, I think that we have to be careful of this subjective approach to deciding what's right and what's wrong. It's wrong for us to decide what is right in our own eyes. We need to refer to God. People who do what is right in their own eyes often have horrific consequences. Holocausts come from this sort of thinking. Suicide bombers come from this sort of thinking. 9-11 comes from this sort of thinking. Afghanistan and the troubles that are there comes from this sort of thinking. The people that are perpetrating the evil think that they're doing the right thing. Sometimes they think they're doing the right thing in the eyes of their God. It's a terrible thing. Um, and it has dreadful consequences. So what we have to have uh, in order to avoid this situation, is a definition of sin, a definition of wrong, which is objective and clear and won't change over time. The biblical one is just that. The biblical one says sin is doing what is wrong in God's eyes, regardless of what we feel or the experts say or the culture agrees on. So what is sin according to God? Sin is violating our relationship with God by making other things into our God. That's called idolatry, having other gods. And it's so hard to get out of. And it takes a loving God and the intervention of a perfect judge or king, we know it's Jesus, and a rebirth to get us to start to see things through God's eyes. Okay, that's my first point about what the Israelites were up to in that time of Judges. The second point is this. There's a subtle danger of doing what is right in our own eyes. It sort of becomes part of us without it, us even being aware of it. Um, there are signs in this section of Scripture that Israel has sideslipped 
into a habit of doing what seems right in their own eyes and worse still, they accept that position and feel security and comfort. They're not referring to what is right in God's eyes. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. Let me point out some of these signs which indicate that this is happening to the people. Um, first of all, the name Samson, the name of the last judge, means son of the sun. The sun was worshipped in pagan religion. And Samson's parents have assimilated this kind of pagan religion around them uh, with, with the Philistines and so on. And, and it seemed like a really good name for their son, son of the sun, son of the sun god. Um, notice the parents haven't rejected God outright, but they are flirting on the borders of other faiths and ideas. It's a dangerous position to be in. Um, the next thing is that Samson goes to a town called Tinmar. Now, Tinmar was a town that was right inside Israelite territory, a town deep inside of Israelite territory, where the Israelites were comfortable with the fact that the Philistines had settled in there. They didn't kick them out. They just thought, this is OK. We can get on. The Philistines were ruling over God's people at that time. And that was unthinkable as far as God was concerned. And for the sake of their security, the Israelites left them unchallenged. They said, let's not poke the bear. Well, there was a Cold War saying which says, it's better red than dead. Really? <laughs> Samson feels so comfortable coming and going to Tinmar that he eventually chooses a woman to be his wife from amongst the Philistines. She must have been fairly good looking and he thought, I want her. And notice what he says. She, he says, she is right in my eyes. As the country song says, how can this be wrong? When it feels so right. Well, the wedding debacle is just incredible. Um, Samson has a wedding for the, his new betrothed and he gets together with people of the town and notably 30 Philistines are at the wedding and Samson gives them a riddle. It's a bit of a party game that he's playing and it's a difficult riddle and he says, if you can't solve it within a specified time, I think it was about four or five days, he said, if you can't solve it, then, then you owe me... 30 pieces of new clothing and 30 new cloaks. And he says to the Philistines, if you solve it, then I will give you a, a new set of clothing each. Well, they turned to Samson's betrothed and said, you brought this man here and he's going to make us poor. This is ridiculous. It's such a hard riddle. Can you find out what the riddle means? Well, she does. She seduces Samson and Samson um, goes back and they say, we've got the answer to the riddle. They give the answer and Samson replies in, in, in the most arrogant way, if you had not have ploughed with my heifer, that being his wife, he said, you would not have found out the answer. So he was furious. He goes to a neighbouring town, kills 30 people, takes their clothing, brings it back and gives it to them, storms out, says to the father-in-law, I no longer want anything to do with her, and he goes away. The father-in-law then betrothes her to someone else. Samson comes back and says, I want my wife. And he said, it's too late, she's gone. He's furious. He's absolutely furious about this situation. So he... He gets together a group of uh, foxes, probably jackals. They're pretty easy to round up, evidently. And, uh, and he ties flaming torches to them and ties them together in teams and lets them run through the fields of the Philistines and destroys the food crop of the town of Tinmar. The Philistines are furious. They, they, go, they find out why this has happened. And they respond by going to Samson's father-in-law and his betrothed and they burn her. Samson hears about this and declares war on them, basically, and, and fights and kills many of them. 
this upsets the Philistines and they say, we are now at war with Israel. Now, here's the interesting thing. Were the Israelites happy with this situation? No, they weren't. Did they rally behind Samson and offer to go to war in order to free the nation from the captivity of the Philistines? Chapter 15, 11 says, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so have I done to them. The Israelites were furious. They said, it's, You've made a difficult situation for us. And so we're going to hand you over to them. So they do, and there's more killing that ensues at the end of that. Can you see what's happening with the people of God? They're fitting in nicely with the surrounding culture. They wanted no disharmony between them and the unbelieving or uncircumcised, as the Bible says, the unbelieving Philistines. That's an important point, actually. Notice that God was not against the Philistines as a race. God was worried about the fact that the Philistines were a pagan race and did not believe in him and that they would affect the Israelites. He's not being racial, he's being theological. We know that God is not happy with the situation that the Israelites are in because he uses a very flawed and sinful judge, Samson, to stir up the conflict and thus remind the people of God that they are in a holy war and that they are to see things through God's eyes and not not see them through their own. Last point I want to make, and I want to conclude with this one. Can I suggest, as a result of what we've just read, that we're very similar to that. We often get comfortable and do what is right in our own eyes. We absorb the unbelieving culture around us, not even aware that we're doing it. We look no differently, think no differently, talk no differently to anybody else around us. The theologian Michael Wilcock, he was a theologian that did a commentary on, on Judges, says this, There is no such thing as a harmonious coexistence between the church and the world. For where there is no conflict, it is because the world has taken over. I'll give you an example of this kind of thing. There was a, um, a, a, a very famous theologian at the beginning of the 20th century called Rudolf Bultmann. Um, you can tell he was a major theologian because he was German. All the really important ones were German. And uh, he believed that modern people could no longer believe in the supernatural. It produced a conflict between us and the unbelieving people around us. And the result was that... Uh, Many churches followed his teaching and they set about de-supernaturalising the faith, getting rid of all the supernatural elements out of God's narrative. And the result was that the word of God was no longer considered to be an accurate and true revelation of himself. The Bible was seen to be a book that was inspiring and full of some really good stories. The concept of being of Jesus being God was extremely suspect. They found that one really hard to swallow. And third, concepts such as sin and new birth and a physical resurrection were abandoned. Problem solved. No conflict with unbelievers if you believe that kind of stuff. Christianity becomes a self-help program where we aim to lead a good life and be kind to, the, to those around us. In other words, to do what is right in our own eyes. But do you see what's happened? The real faith is gutted and we're left with no hope, nothing substantial to offer anyone and worse still, we are diminishing our relationship with God who gives life. Let's not go this way. Let's humbly, lovingly and respectfully share and live the faith even when it produces conflict with the world around us. And let us walk doing right in God's eyes. Let me pray. 
God, help us to be a people who are committed solely to you. Help us to be a people not committing idolatry. Help us to be a people who trust you and know that you are true. Help us not to be afraid of conflict with those around us, but at the same time, keep us gentle and humble as we share the truth with people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning, guys. It's been wonderful to gather together again. I'm excited for our online Zoom hang, which is about to happen. Uh, if you're a regular member of RPAC, you should have a link in an email uh, that Jared sent out during the week. Uh, you click on that link and you should be sent to an online Zoom uh, hang with a bunch of other people from church. Come and just do some friendship, reconnect. Um, I really encourage you to, to be there. Um, I'm going to just pray now uh, that God would uh, bless us as we head out into the week um, as a church and he'd still be using us and working through us during the week. And um, I'm also just going to send up a prayer for anyone who's studying right now, starting to get to the hairy end of the HSC and uni students are starting to get to the hairy end of the semester. So I'm just going to pray for them as well. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you so much that we could gather together again this morning as a church. Father, we pray uh, that you would help us all as we go out into the week. We pray that all of us, as members of this church, as your children, who've been saved and redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, we pray, Lord, that we would bring you honour and glory as we conduct ourselves in the world this week. We pray that the truth and love of the gospel might be evident in our words and in our actions as we interact with our friends and families and workmates and schoolmates and everyone who we come into contact with. Father God, may our faith, may the truth of the gospel shine brightly uh, from us 
as a, as a church family during the week. Father God, we uh, also want to pray for the members of our church who are studying, especially the HSC students. Father, um, Mia and Bridget, Lord, we pray that they would have an okay time the next few weeks as they finish their study and prepare for their exams. Lord, um, ultimately they are your children. Uh, and so we pray that they would know uh, that their whole lives are not wrapped up in success or failure in these exams. But we do pray, Father, that um, they would uh, give a good showing of what they've learned as they do their exams and they would leave feeling satisfied uh, that they did a good job and that their, the work they put in was honoured. And we also pray for our uni students, Father, help them to end the semester well and strongly. Lord God, thank you so much for everything we've learnt this morning, for everything we've been able to um, do as we come before you in worship and praise and prayer. And Father God, uh, may we all be blessed uh, during the week. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. I'll see you on the Zoom chat. Bye.